Welcome back to another episode of Scared of Normal. I'm Mike Murphy, joined by my co-host Sean Neer, and today we're sitting down with multifaceted, all-around badass Joey Schusler. Dude, we can't thank you enough for being here. This is going to be a really fun episode. And uh, before we jump into all this, I want to say thank you so much for the endless support since the beginning of Traction. You've uh, you've been a big pillar in us getting this thing rolling. So thank you so much, man. Yeah. No, it's great to see you guys. Great to sit down and chat. Um, it's been a bit and it's been awesome to see Traction grow over the last couple of years. Yeah, you got you gave us like the biggest shove in the beginning. You're just like, hey, we're starting up. Like, I'll do a video for you guys. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you roll in with that like huge lens and like in an hour put together like the best launch video we could ever ask for. And uh, didn't he drop it early? Yeah, and we had inadvertently. Like, I don't know if you know this. You are the reason that we launched when we did. <laughs> October we were planning, 18th. Yeah, we yeah. were planning on being uh, <laughs> November 1st. Oh. And you posted the video on Instagram. And you're like, so stoked for my homie Sean, like launching traction. <laughs> and like the Instagram page just started going crazy. Amazing. And I remember calling Sean and I was like, Hey, uh, I think I think we gotta like make this happen now. And I was up for like forty eight hours <laughs> oh, straight, damn. like getting the website done. This is all news to me so, uh, years later. But we had like the best <laughs> first month ever. Like yeah. sales were amazing. So yeah. we're like, thank you, Joey. Yeah, yeah, it was so sick, man. Yeah, that was a cool time. Yeah. Like I think it was just so much energy, and everyone was psyched to see just something new going down. Totally. What do you think when you walked into the <clears throat> barn? And you're like, this is where you guys, you made it look <laughs> so cool. Your video is so dope. And uh, cause I didn't know how it was going to turn out. You know, we were always thinking we put black sheets behind it. So no one would know, but uh, we didn't even do that. You made it look so good. Yeah. I mean, that's all, all marketing is, is just, yeah. you know, a little bit of smoke and mirrors <laughs> until you can build what you want. And like, by the looks of this place, you guys are, have done it. Thank you, dude. It's been super cool to see, see yeah. it all grow. Yeah. It was cool to like see that video and those photos turn back and like actually be what we had envisioned the company to look like when we didn't have like the means to make it look that way. So yeah, thanks for helping us uh, realize that. Yeah. And it's been super cool seeing you guys kind of take it by the reins and create this podcast and all the cool media and stuff you've done. And yeah, it's just awesome to see to see friends making cool things. You're the man, dude. When we originally put Scared of Normal together, there's three athletes that came to mind, and you were one of three. So the other was Dakota Norton and Hillary Allen were like the original OGs. So finally got you on. So yeah. Thank yeah, this you for is coming. a treat, man. It truly <laughs> but, is a treat. Yeah. But yeah, let's get into it. Um, I think first off, who is Joey Schusler for people that don't know? Yeah, Joey Schusler. He's a... Uh, Definitely had some evolutions over the years. Um, for those that don't know, Sean and I go way back, uh, I think probably to around 2002, 2003, racing bikes here in Colorado. Uh, back then it was the Mountain States Cup and Sean and I were racing downhill and dual slalom and, you know, dabbling in dirt jumping a bit. Um, and yeah, immediately Sean kind of stormed onto the scene as this young kid with just insane talent. And chubby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like riding a bike like no one else was Thank back you, then. Um, so kind of just have like these early like scenes of Sean and I burned into my mind of us competing together. Yep. Um, and well, it's just, funny you were like a year or two older and I always looked up to you. You know, you got on Yeti. All I wanted was to be on like that RPM team. And so, yeah, it was cool to like chase you because I never really beat you as a kid. I was always just like trying to nip at your heels. Yeah. And uh, you were like my carrot growing up the whole time. I was like, I just want to beat Joey. <laughs> yeah. I think you might have had me in dual slalom, but in downhill. Even four cross. So like, yeah. I have a bunch of second places to you. Yeah. But yeah, it was cool times. There's definitely like some pretty distinct chapters in our friendship looking back. And it's like those early racing ones. It was like. It was friendship, but it was definitely like some fierce competition. Hundred <laughs> percent. It's always good to have each other. that, right? Like yeah. have that, like you know, aggression towards each other yeah. while you're racing, but off track, you can be friends. Yeah. And, yep. and I think racing at that age is so interesting too, because it's like it's so like intense and like emotional. Yep. And I feel like when you get older and you get into racing, you know, you maybe can compartmentalize that a bit better. But back then, it was just like full on like emotion like totally wanting to win and when you also the, have that aspect of like parents breathing down your neck when you're that age too yeah. you know where you're like performing for yourself but if you're not doing good your parents are yeah. like I there. don't know. We we had pretty cool parents. Yeah. Like like Sean's dad was like do, running the timing. Yeah. Like kind of like coding all the computer software for the timing, and my dad was just chilling, didn't care how I did it all. 
And was, I think the two of them would just shoot the shit together the whole time. <laughs> that's and rad. They're like, well, if we're going to spend all our weekends together. We might as well just hang out have and have fun. a good time. Yeah, it's so different coming from BMX. It was like that because yeah. it was, you know, you need to. Just the aggravated parents. Yeah. Just yeah. the, yeah, the moto dad. But yeah, you get to mountain biking and that's what made me fall in love with it. It was just so chill and like your time's totally. your time. You're kind of racing the, the clock a lot of the time. So yeah, it was funny. One of my questions was I had hit my head a lot of times. Do you actually know the first time we met? I can't, it's probably like Nathrop or I couldn't remember. I think my first memory was watching you drop in on the dual slalom at Keystone. Mm. I don't know the exact year, but it was, I think it was 2003. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. And you were on a uh, blue Haro. Blue Haro, yeah. You were on the lens for it. Yeah. And I think you had a fixed jersey on then. Yeah. The black one with the, the flames. flames. Dude, I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy how all these little memories, like, I feel like I'm pretty forgetful on a lot of things these days, but like there's specific memories that are so burned in. Yep. Let's, uh, I wanted to ask what was your first real mountain bike in my head? It had to be like one of your pro descenders or lens sport bikes that was built in Colorado. <laughs> and what, what that bike mean to you? Was it like, Hey, I want to race mountain bikes, you know, full time now, like. What was that like getting that first mountain bike? Well, even growing up in Boulder, like mountain biking in like around 2002, 2000, 2003 wasn't like that huge. Like it was either, it was very specialized. You're either like a cross country racer with like a super light bike or a downhill racer with like a big heavy bike. Yeah. There wasn't this like trail bike scene that you see now, like at all, like that technology wasn't out yet. Um, and so... I kind of trended towards the downhill side of things, wanted to get into it, had been going to these summer camps in Boulder, uh, single track mountain bike adventures, just like kind of like a normal kid's summer camp and had just like really fallen in love with it there. And like my mom wasn't totally on board yet. My dad wasn't on board. It was like, what's this sport? It seems dangerous. It's expensive. Like we're not really on board. And Matt who ran that program kind of like fostered, uh, that conversation with my parents to like, let them know that like, Hey, your son like loves this and yeah. really wants to do it. And I don't think there's any stopping him. And so he was kind of like the liaison between me and my parents. And he kind of kept enabling it and enabling it and ended up taking me to my first race. And then I think he had been d given a lens sport that had been donated to him for an auction and it didn't go at the auction. So he just gave it to me. Dang. And then helped me like source all these old parts, like all these old weird parts from like the depths of like, I don't know, the old Trek team or something that like so D-Max cool. wheels and like weird old like boxer fork. And do you still um, stay in touch with Matt or do you? Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. No way. Yeah. He's still running the program. I mean, he's probably brought thousands of kids up through that program. Yep. Um, and like, yeah, Kate Rao kind of launched the the high school league off of that which yeah. is now obviously massive so yeah it's people like that like early on that that really make it happen and it's cool to look back on those those kind of things and see where it's taken me yeah but yeah i remember that first bike just being so in love yeah and like it had like three inches of suspension with like a box <laughs> on the front yep and then, like, I took it out to, like, Devin Lenz at his, like, warehouse out in Fort Lupton, and he, like, modified it so it had four inches of travel oh with, like, this God. special link. It. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's sick. <laughs> why, why I asked, like, that Haro was, like, 600 bucks, and it was, like, the biggest deal to me. Yeah. So I was just, like, in my head, I was, like, yeah. Yeah, you had to have that one bike. Yeah. So. I think I put, like, a 1000 bucks into it after the free frame, and it was, like, it Those was just, the like. days. Yeah. There's, like, a photo of me on the stairs at my parents' house just, like playing the frame like it's like a guitar <laughs> just like just too much pajamas out, just dude. like absolutely jacked do you still have it on the wall or did you sell no, it i ended up selling it could you imagine getting that back <laughs> i would love to see that haro it's yeah it's definitely broken yeah <laughs> the head tube is snapped off somewhere wherever oh, it is at least you have your teeth <laughs> yeah that is like a broken bar or a broken head tube the worst. Do you ever have a fork snap at the crown? I've done a couple, yeah. That's like Underneath, the worst. Like feeling. the where your forks go. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing worse, man. Um, so yeah, you grew up in Boulder, right? Right outside of Boulder in the mountains. Like, let's talk about that a little bit. What kind of impact did that have on your life growing up, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I grew up like twenty minutes up outside of Boulder, so kind of out on my own in the woods. Only child for the most part. So it was just kind of left to my own devices to to uh, entertain myself. For the and, most part, older sister, right? Uh, like, yeah, but yeah. way older. Yeah, she's like 
12 years older. So okay. she moved out like when I was yeah pretty young. Yeah. She was off to college. Um, so yeah, essentially only child as far as growing up in the woods was concerned. And uh, yeah, just to entertain myself, it was like either like mountain biking or sledding. So I was like, <laughs> if it's snowing, I was creating like crazy jumps for my sled. And yep. then if it was summer or fall or whatever, just building berms and jumps. And yeah, there was a ton of BLM and national forest land around that I kind of just putzed around and kept building and keeping myself entertained on bikes. And then eventually yeah. friends would come up and yeah, by the time I was 18, there was like a full trail network up there wow. and we were shuttling everywhere and like had Sick. a whole scene. I missed out on that. Um, you invited me a couple of times, but just being a butthead kid, I never took you up <laughs> on it. But uh, Yeah, you don't realize how cool that stuff is until you get a little older, you know? I know. Like, I don't know. What I'd go back to ride, you know, the other trails up there, the old um, trails up Sunshine and your place and this yeah. and that. I'm just like, I feel like I missed out on an era. It's like a little too young, but yeah. Um, kind of want to jump into the fire up there and how that impacted you and your family because that moved you guys down the hill the trails were gone like that was i think that's when we started becoming like more friends was after that like when you because you were still racing at that time right yeah 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 that was my last year well last proper year of downhill yeah but yeah that was uh that was in 2010 so i was 20 years old and it was the year that i had gotten bumped up from the Yeti national team to the Yeti world cup team. And I was like over the moon. It was yeah. like, you know, Aaron Gwynn was my teammate and that's when he was kind of coming up before he had won anything, but he was in the top five, like just about to crack the code. Um, like Blinkensop, Leov, Graves, Richie, all on the team. Like it was an insane that's team so to crazy. be a part of. What a <laughs> roster, dude. dude. I know. I was about to say, that's like yeah. one of the most <laughs> legendary teams Totally. Ever. And to be 20 and to get to ride with those guys every yeah. weekend was insane. I can that's only bizarre. imagine what Blinky was back then. Yeah. Just but like that, how wild. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, it was a hard season. Like went over to Europe, had never raced in the mud, had never ridden on routes, like just got waxed over there. Like I wasn't set up there. And then there was some dry races and I did good at those, but like, I was just not ready for Europe. Yep. So it was like, it was a pretty tough season, like for me. Yep. Um, and then came home that fall and had like, yeah, had had my first girlfriend that like real girlfriend for like a year yeah. and I was psyched. And then like, she ended up breaking up with me and I was like, oh, oh that's no. brutal. And then like my childhood dog died the next week. I was like, oh, crushed. And then the week after that, uh, this house that I grew up in that my parents had built was in the four mile fire, lost everything, barely got out of there in time. Jeez. So it was like kind of this like incredibly pivotal moment in my life, you know, 20 years old. That's kind of like everything you have going for you is like a race season that didn't go well. Like, like girlfriend breaks up with you, dog that you love dies and like your home and all your trails and everything are just burned down and completely gone zero earthly possessions it's just like the rug ripped out from under yeah you, it was man. insane so you like, didn't get much out of the fire not like a box of photos and like just screaming at my mom to get in the car because we gotta wow. go insane. like there was no warning or anything like no one called no one was there to be like hey you guys should leave it was like a decision yeah i leave. guess there wasn't really like cell phones and like that yeah. type of like awareness yeah. that we yeah. have now no, so that's there's no crazy like to think about emergency like twitter feed or anything wow. it was just like we're gone insane just happens um, fast so that was kind of like yeah a very pivotal moment like really traumatic for me uh but i'd kind of been interested in getting into film and photo f- um before that um Yeti had always had kind of like in-house people that did film and photo work, um, like Clay Porter originally, and then John Reynolds and Craig Grant. And as a writer, I'd worked with all those guys a ton and, you know, had always been very interested in the video side of things. And they had kind of been teaching me the ropes, but it was like that moment that it was like, maybe I need to think, switch things up a bit. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, I was at, CU University of Colorado at the time they had this like disaster emergency fund where they just gave me like 10 grand in cash and the Red Cross gave me 2000 bucks that I had to spend within 24 hours wow. <laughs> as part of the, some disaster relief so I just took that all that money and I was like I'm not going to buy clothes I'm not going to buy anything else like buy figure figure that all out just buy the camera no way so I spent every last penny on camera kit what'd you get 
Uh, was, yeah, Canon 7D. It was before Sony's sick. were running hot. That was the rig then. That too. was the absolute yeah. rig back then. Those things were sick. I mean, totally. they're still sick. Yeah. But like they, that they was the They had a shit. good look. They had a really good look. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like what I learned on. And then through that, like kind of kept racing for the next few years. Did like a little bit of downhill the next year. Obviously, the Enduro World Series started, like, what, 2012, was it? 13, yeah. 2013. So a couple years after that and did a couple good seasons on that. Had some good, sixth, good results. Right? Yeah. That's si- huge. Sixth yeah. at the Winter Park EWS. Wow. Yeah. Got, like, second on a stage. I had a Nico Vuyo. I was like, oh, yeah. That's sick. But I was with some kids the other day, and they said they didn't know who Nico Vuyo was, and they're pro mountain bikers. So oh, I was, yeah. like, Kidding totally me? blown away. Isn't totally that hard blown when away. It, that starts happening? It was really yeah. hard for me because he's a 10-time world champion yeah. you know, in a sport that's been around for, like, 25 years. In but it happens like so UCI. fast, dude. <laughs> like no, it was you, crazy. Those guys get phased out years. so fast, which sucks, man. Like, yeah. Yep. And kids are, like, only aware of kind of what's in front of them. Totally. You got to learn like the pedigree of yeah. where this all came from. Man. Imagine yeah. if we were at Valmont and asked everyone who Mike Aiken was, there'd have to be a couple that'd be like, oh, oh certainly yeah. there would be a bunch oh, of kids yeah. that would have no idea. Yeah. You know, it's kind of bizarre to think about that. But. Yeah. Uh, before we step away from racing, I know we're kind of moving from it a bit, but uh, I want to go back to that World Cup series because most every racer that I know that goes over there, they're not equipped, like you said, to race in Europe. It's a different toolbox. We have a toolbox that we've made in Colorado or where at, you know, it's dry, you know, pebbles on hard pack. And then you go over in there and you're like, I don't know how to, I don't have the right tools for this. Yeah. You get whacked, the rule of thumb, you get waxed the first year, then you kind of go home licking your wounds, reset and go out there. My question is, what was it like, you know, racing along Aaron, that team that you're talking about, Blanky, and did you enjoy it as much as you thought? Cause I know for me, all I wanted as a kid was to race in Europe, watching Sladming happen, Champery. And it was like, I built it up into this like mystical creature. And then when I did it, it was insane, but it wasn't exactly what I thought. What was it like being over there finally? Cause I imagine you kind of pictured it the same way I did or built it up. Yeah. I think, you know, maybe I built it up too much, like, and then got there and didn't really hit my expectations yeah. and it was pretty crushing. Yeah. It was hard. It was a hard season for sure. hundred percent. And then like, it's all about momentum and like I had none. Yep. And then I remember coming back to the East Coast and uh, decided to, or I did Mount St. Anne, decided to bail on Bromont the next weekend, came back and it was the, the Colorado State Championships, Mountain States Cup at Sol Vista yep. and ended up winning. Damn. And that was like a huge momentum shift and I had like a super strong end of the season. That's so sick. Like finished like, I don't know, top 40 at Wyndham and it's huge. some good splits and stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that fire was like the big event that shifted it. Like, I think if that hadn't happened, I probably would have kept cracking at it, doing more seasons in Europe. But there was something about that event that was just like, I'm going to totally do something new. That's so cool. So, yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that if I had kept racing downhill, I could have made it. But yeah. kind of same know. boat for me. Like, I only did a couple out of my van and yeah still have like the what if in my brain but i don't you know just think about it all the time whereas like before i raced ews is it's like all i thought about was like what am i doing you know like the one good thing i was good at i let go away and where could i be what if this and like now it's like yeah that would have been cool but like it would have taken away from my this yeah same thing for you yeah now like 10 years later, 12 years later, whatever, like zero regrets. Like yeah. the amount of things I've been able to experience and how I've able been able to set up a career that, you know, I think can last much, much longer now is it's been really cool. A lot more sustainable that way, which is cool. For yeah. sure. You seem happier than ever too. So I think it was the right move, you know? Yeah. Racing is feeling like you're bipolar. Sure. You yeah. Know? Like but it, it was hard. Because like, yeah. like when I stopped racing Enduro, you know, like that season I had done like top 10 in a EWS. So yeah. it was just like, like, what am I leaving on the table? But I'm like, totally. if I'm going to get into film and photo work, like, I got to go all in. Like, these bigger adventures that I started doing then, yeah. like 2014, it was like, I got to go all in. Like, there's only so many weeks and days and hours in a year. Like, yep. I got to dedicate them all to one thing. I'll never forget Chris Conroy, the owner of Yeti. Um, before I was on the team, I went in there. Because of you, I was riding for Yeti. But it was just as an ambassador, and I really wanted to race for the team, but do downhill all these things. And I was like, Hey, I'll go get you media. I'll race kind of try to put this all, this whole package together for him. He's like, why would you do that? Just so sternly. He's like, 
don't be mediocre at both. Go be really good at one and just like pretty much push me out of his office. And it was like what I needed. And I was yeah. like, all right, media's bullshit. I'm going to go win races. Yep. And it's what I needed to hear to like go yeah. full in. And like it hurt in the moment to hear that my idea was stupid. <laughs> but like it changed my life when I like kind of said, same thing with you. Is like you could have done both and like yeah. tried to do it, but you would have been mediocre. Or not You're mediocre, just juggling yeah. too many yeah, things at that point. Your you know? bandwidth just gets tapped mm-hmm. and something has to give a bit. What's yeah. your uh, most memorable race or like proudest moment of racing? I th- for- I think that EWS at Winter Park, like yeah. the home crowd and just like kind of feeling like I'm on the pace. And I think I crashed like three or four times in that race. In that like, race? Yeah. Wow. Like you kidding me? Over the bars, like <laughs> full on washed out a couple of times. Like I think I was like, it felt cool to kind of feel like I was on the pace of like the fastest in the world top for three. like a yeah. weekend, you know? Dude, that's insane. So you would have <laughs> been top three, maybe, you know? Yeah. That's I think pretty so, wild but to think about. Yeah. It's like I didn't, but it's pretty cool to know the pace is there. Yeah, yeah for sure. Hey, right? you know what they say: <laughs> older I get, the faster I was. That's true. <laughs> That's how I feel. I'm like back in my day. I don't know, man. Some days I go out and I feel faster now than I ever was. Yeah, when we. But up, I think the bikes are really, yeah, really, say, really, really good right the technology now. Technology yeah. is uh, really stepped yeah. up from what I it was. I raced a years lot ago. on 26 inch bikes. Yeah, like that. That EWS result was on it. SB66. Wow, no that's way. so bizarre to think about. <laughs> With well, a double front chain ring. That's You're a moving. vintage bicycle these days. <laughs> Dude, could you imagine? Dude, I, would, no. I would love to ride the SB6 again. Yeah. Um, but when we were shuttling a couple weeks ago, you were moving. I was on a downhill bike and you're pulling me. So you're riding so well. That's sick, man. But um, let's uh, let's jump back to your time, you know, talking about being in school in Boulder. What were you studying? So I went to school. That was like one thing that I thought was pretty cool with my parents is like, they're always like, you can do whatever you want. We support your racing 100%, but, like, they really pushed me in school, which, like, in retrospect, like, I didn't learn that much in, like, my degree, which was in advertising and, like, media kind of stuff. But it taught me how to, like, just communicate and talk to people better. And, like, looking at my job now, that's, like, all it is, is, like, just talking with people, like, trying to convey an idea of what you're trying to do. Like, that's, like, the biggest skill you could have. And I think I did get a lot of that at college. So, like, yeah. Maybe like the material of the classes didn't teach me a ton, but yeah. like just like the des- just, discipline and communication. Exactly. Exactly. That's cool, man. So, yeah. And yeah, being at University of Colorado was super fun. Like made a lot of really good friends there that I'm still friends with today. And um yeah, there was a great cycling culture and community through school there. Yeah. Heck yeah. What year did you graduate? Uh twenty thirteen, bonus spring semester twenty thirteen. Rad. Yeah. Heck yeah, man. But, yeah, that's cool. It's always interesting to hear like, you know, how people feel like that era of their life life translates to their career now. So it's cool to hear that it like is beneficial in some ways to what you're doing. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that communication piece is I was just thinking about how freelance people get jobs, even just as athletes and like you really have to be, you know, not the broy, but just like yeah, like you're saying, like be clear, concise, you know, you're coming with these crazy conceptions. Be like, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what you're going to get. And, like, something I struggle with a lot, you know, is to really, I don't know, just find that common ground with people and, yeah. you know, with sponsors. Be like, hey, you're going to pay me this. I'm going to give you that. And, like, it's cool to see, you know, your client list, which is, you know, Red Bull, Fox, Chevrolet, Budweiser, you know, the nor- <laughs> like the biggest name. So it's like obviously what you're doing is working and uh, it makes sense that you have that background. So teach me. Teach me your ways. <laughs> High level communication, man. It's yeah. difficult. It yeah. is, you yeah. know. It really is. It's a it's a hard thing to do, and it's cool, you know. Like I said, it is cool to hear to hear that it's translated from school, you know, somewhat. And like obviously, yeah. you had the racing career that like you also had to like kind of navigate and communicate that way. But it's totally and like from a young age, my mom was like, "I'm not going to keep buying these bikes. Like you got to <laughs> you got to get good, and yep. you got to get sponsored if you want to keep doing it." Yep. Or you got to get a job to pay for it. So I went the route of, you know, hitting up companies. And I think I got my first sponsorship at like 15. What was it? Uh, I got a Smith sponsorship when I was around 15. Heck yeah. Wait. It was just like, you know, two <laughs> pairs of goggles a year. Do you remember what you like, pitched them on? I just had made like a cover letter and a resume with my results and like some photos that I had like, you know, just 
kind of photoshopped out and like Xerox together with Xerox, my results. Xerox, man. <laughs> <laughs> Lenowski over here. Yeah. yeah. And then I would like wait on my AOL email address, like refreshing to see if like <laughs> oh I got God. anything on like our dial up internet oh, up in the man. mountains. And then when it finally comes through, you're just sitting there like, do I want to open this? What does it yeah, say? Yeah, totally. When did you get on Yeti and what was that like? Was it like 15, 15 16? No, no, it was a little later. Uh, I had gotten on Specialized for a year mm. when I was 17. And then I went to Yeti when I was 18. RPM? Or was it straight uh, to national? It was the regional team they had okay. back then. Yeah, yeah. And then national team later that year. It's all I wanted as a kid. Yeah. Looked up to you. Um, <laughs> while we're on talking about being kids, did you have a MySpace? I did have a MySpace. What was your MySpace song? Uh, well, I wasn't like the most musically like <laughs> gifted kid, but... I loved the Alex Rankin Earthed videos Ooh, and yep. like oh, yeah. those music, the, the music in those was definitely like a very like specific vibe that I don't think I could have ever sourced <laughs> on my own at that age. I think I got Earthed one when I was 13. Yep. And so I was just like listening to these songs on repeat and they just kind of became like the music I kind of like, yep. like still to this day. That's super Can you cool. name one song? <clears throat> I mean, he had a lot of Brian Jonestown Massacre Oof. and I still to this day just absolutely devour that stuff. Yep. It's so good. What would your My Spot, MySpace song be today? Uh, Probably something from, from Brian Jonestown. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Easy oh yeah. Enough. There's a lot of good songs. They have yeah. like 30 albums. Dude, yeah, it's hard movies. to pick just one, man. Yeah. Real um, hard. But you'd definitely be in my top eight friends. Both you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Traction would be up there too if you guys had a brand. That page. might be the nicest thing someone's <laughs> That's ever true. said to me. That's very yeah. true. That's what an era that was. We talk about that every <laughs> every time we ask this question. Shout out to James Stoko because he's not here and this is his question. <laughs> but we always joke around about how funny it was and like how gnarly it was like to have the top eight. <laughs> so know? gnarly. That was like some very valuable real estate. Yeah. Like that was hard to like decide yeah. who was even number one on your top totally. eight. Totally. Yeah, we had an interesting go growing up without a lot of that technology and then coming into it as it was being developed. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like such a big part of our jobs, like with being sponsored athletes. Yeah. yeah. Talking about MySpace, do you remember the first video that you filmed and put together, first like group of photos that you posted on the internet? Do you remember what that was from? Yeah, well, there was the first bike one, but the first big video I had, my one of my best buddies growing up, Mason Lacey, him and I filmed a extreme sledding video. Oh my god! That ended up getting several million <laughs> oh, views on YouTube. No way! Still, like the most views I've ever gotten on anything was his sledding video. You're it was, joking? Like, the limelight of the the prime time of the internet being born. He got hurt so bad, huh? Oh yeah, and just filming. It was basically like early kook slams or something. Yeah. Jerry the day, like, like was that Mason that fell? Uh, it was Spencer, his younger Spencer. brother, but like, yeah, we just filmed like his younger brother getting hurt on a sled. And like, I remember like, like a box of like 10 sleds showed up on my mom's office and she thought I like stole her credit card and ordered all these sleds. <laughs> and I was like, no mom, we got sponsored. <laughs> we're like 14. So I was sponsored for sledding before mountain bike. That's amazing. <laughs> How old were you when you made that video? Like 13. Yeah. Oh, no way. Was yeah. that on, did that, that live on YouTube? Yeah. Is it, it still on YouTube? It since got day? taken down because I think we had stolen his parents' U2 CD and ripped it and like put oh, like Bloody God. Sunday or something <laughs> to the sledding. <laughs> Can got you see that video struck. still? I've got it on a hard drive. Will you send oh it to us? Gosh. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen yeah. it. So I feel this, like we need to put a clip it was, in this podcast. Our production company was Complete Insanity Films. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what a name, dude. So they're at the dunes and you just see this kid like coming down the dunes on the sled and you're like, he's going pretty quick. And then he goes off and it, the hillside just drops away and you're like, holy shit. And then he like throws the sled and you're like, oh my God. Yeah. And just Still like flying through the air. Slams. He must have went like 70 six, foot. 70 foot. Mega Damn. slam. Yeah. Did he Real have to bad. get helied out? Yep. Oh my God. On a sled. <laughs> yeah. Damn, that's crazy. I'm <laughs> yeah. excited to see this. That one, yeah, the most viral. I remember seeing it absolutely everywhere. Yeah. That's pretty crazy to think about. It's yeah. crazy. You know, I'm going to go back up to all your films, Elk Mountain, you know, Racing Winner, Why Wash, Flashes of Atli, um, you know, RJ Ripper. All these are Vimeo staff picks, this, that. But you peaked at the age 13. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. It's crazy. How does that make you feel? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. It was just a cool time on the internet, honestly. No, I know. We all lived it. It yeah. was cool. Yeah, that was a very, like, <laughs> I don't think any of us really understood what was going on with the internet yet. Like, imagine if you would have known, like, what kind of magic you could have captured by continuing to make videos like that. Totally. Like, you could be the most subscribed to YouTuber oh, abs- on Earth absolutely. Right now, which is bizarre to think about. You, you know, know what's crazy is that... I remember seeing this probably at 16, 17. So that was still so viral three or four years later that I don't even real didn't realize you were that young. So I thought you were like 16, 18. I think that the one you're thinking of was a couple years after. Was there two of them? It was a sequel. There are a couple couple of those sledding (laughs) hits went viral. (laughs) No, I'm thinking of the one where he throws a sled and dies. Yeah, yeah. That one that one was more like we were like 16 or 17. Oh, okay. okay. So I haven't seen the OG. Yeah. You haven't probably seen the OG. Oh, okay. That's okay. crazy. So you went, you killed yourself and then he went back out and killed himself again. Yeah. There was he, some reoccurring themes for sure. He got hurt pretty bad the second time too. Yeah. Oh my God. Was this, did YouTube have ad revenue at this point in time or was it no, just, just no. for the clout? That's you guys it was were just, just doing for it the for, clout. for the yeah. viralness. That was before the whole internet advertising ecosystem had kind of come to come to life like it is now that's so crazy dude so big sledder sponsored sledder <laughs> what's something that most people don't know about joey juicer i don't know probably. i feel like we just uncovered one of them <laughs> probably that's definitely <laughs> a big one um i don't know it's all pretty pretty much out there pretty open yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard you, when you, you document. you've uncovered all the secrets <laughs> yeah when you document your life the way that you do it's hard to for be sure. a man of mystery that's for sure yeah let's uh let's talk a little bit about how your career really got spurred you know we talk about that a lot but like between the two of you guys like you made something really cool happen so let's jump into that a little bit yeah so i wasn't as good as joey when we grew up and I didn't get a ride out of juniors. You know, I went to junior worlds, was on the map, but never got that ride. And when I was 18, I was like, all right, I'm going to be an electrician, yada, yada. When I was, went and was an electrician, but got depressed. I was like, I need to ride bikes. And then, you know, got back into racing, but I was on my own, you know, living out of my van. And then you stepped away from racing and got your camera. And was Elk Mountains your first paid gig? Cause that's when you hit me up. We hadn't talked in quite a while and you just reached out to me to be a part of the film, which ended up getting my foot in the door with Yeti and was basically the, you know, the turn I needed. And literally I would not be sitting in this room without this guy. So literally that's what got me my race career back. So I really can't thank you enough, but yeah, tell us about Elk Mountains and how that came up and yeah. why you reached <clears throat> out. So there was actually like about two years right after college where I, was in-house working at Yeti as an employee, Um, which, yeah, probably not a lot of people know about. That's like the only two years I've ever had like a real like on a salary kind of like job, like on a roster kind of thing. What was your job title? Um, So I don't know how Chris Conroy would tell this story, but I, (laughs) I basically started Yeti's Instagram and Twitter and Facebook accounts kind of like unbeknownst to them they kind of knew it was just like oh yeah like someone should probably do that so i did it and because i was on the race team and just kind of got into it and all of a sudden those things kind of became bigger and bigger for brands and like one day like kind of basically when college was about to end and i was about to graduate it was like so chris that's like a job right and he's like yeah yeah i guess it is (laughs) Um, so I kind of came on as like Yeti's like social media manager but, and like kind of like doing a lot of photo and video work with with Craig and John. Obviously, they had two in-house photo video guys, so they didn't need a third, but that's kind of one of the, what they ended up getting. Um, and then John eventually moved on and I kind of could step into a bigger role on the, the photo video stuff with Craig. Um, so, yeah, that Elk Mountains project was kind of my first big project with Yeti that – I kind of got to direct and lead the charge on without Craig or John kind of leading it off. Um, so just kind of hit up some of the old homies, Sean and Rudy Unrau and um, my good buddy, Michael Larson, and got the three of them together for a little riding filming trip up in Crested Butte. So good. I um, actually called Rudy the other day. He's in Florida. No way. At all places. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was, were you filming on that Canon or were you on a Sony 
I think we just had some random rental Sony. Yeah. Uh, and, and the Canon. We had like a couple cameras. Yep. And that's that was like the first, one of the first few projects where I kind of started working with uh, now longtime collaborator, Thomas Woodson, mm. good buddy of mine. How did you guys meet? Uh, he just moved to, he had moved to Colorado that same year from South Carolina and then just kind of hit me up and kept bugging me. And we got out for a few days and hit it off. That's funny. Um, but first real film You know, together. when you're, you're 24, you kind of like those relationships bud pretty quickly. I think at that age, you yeah, guys have been super like organic and quick the way that yeah. stuff develops. Inseparable yeah. really. Well, you know, on most projects that like he is your right hand, like you guys work interchangeably and. I mean, we're leaving for Italy in two weeks and who's there, you know, yeah. him and Ben Page. Totally. So it's just cool to see that trust and companionship. So totally. Um, but yeah, that was kind of how we, we kicked it off and brought Sean into the fold at Yeti. Uh, that video was, turned out sweet. I'm still psyched on it. And uh, I think from there we were kind of able to build a platform to, to get more projects going with Yeti. And then obviously the, the infamous Green River mm-hmm. trip was like, I think the next February or something. Yeah, so Yeti knew who I was, but didn't pick me up. It was really you calling me again. That's really what got my foot in the door. And then we did that photo shoot, and then it was like, all right. Well, yeah. You know, I think you were higher up at Yeti too, because you were starting to manage ambassadors as well. Yeah. I well, that's, that's that's one thing when I was at Yeti that I I actually was able to start the ambassador program. I was like, we need no, to support really riders cool. outside of just racers, yeah. and that's when I was stepping back from racing too. Mm. Um, Do you think so that, my that mind was, was part of, of that why <laughs> you wanted to go that direction is because you I were stepping it, back? Yeah, for sure. But it also just made sense. It was yeah. like, we need to support these people that are cool outside of racing. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty like pretty early on thing to do though like in that time period like ambassadors or like the influencer thing really wasn't existing. So it's cool to like kind of have that foresight and I guess you being an athlete really leads you into you know having that foresight which is pretty cool. So Totally. He was uh, interesting in his job. He uh, incentivized <laughs> me with a nickel a like on Instagram. So I was just over here like a little crackhead trying to get <laughs> likes so I could pay my gas in my van, dude. <laughs> I literally got a problem with Instagram because of you. So I was like, I need to get like, because I forgot what the cap was. It was probably like three grand or something. Yeah. But it was a lot of likes. That's a lot of nickels. Did you get paid? I did. Sick. Do you yeah. remember how many likes you got? I, I think I capped it out. at 20, It was like 2,500. I forget how many likes, That's but it was sick. like. Three, was it for the Canyon photo? Or no, you know it was it like was the whole oh, the year. the whole project. Yeah. I see. That's so, funny. Thank you. I it was for, just I funny. I forgot about that. Yeah. That's pretty badass. <laughs> was it likes on your Instagram or yeah, on mine? Their, damn. Okay. So, but it had to be like, use like a Yeti hashtag or Yeti, you know, at. And in that photo, if you tallied them all up, every, I think, 2,500 likes was like. 100 bucks or something heck yeah and it, yeah it really got me to push my social it's a pretty good deal that, uh, <laughs> but you're just like you know i'm tied to my phone I'm like all right i need to get the skin it helped me a lot but like i felt like it gave me a problem with instagram too yeah. So. yeah that's so sick for you like that green river trip the the photo of sean jumping over that canyon that photo went so crazy like i remember like you know i've known sean since i was 15 years old but we hadn't talked very much up until that point again and I remember seeing that photo like so much when we started talking again around that time. Like, what do you think that that did for your career? Oh, uh, just because I mean, it was seen by so yeah, many publications. I mean, it was definitely like the biggest thing that had ever happened to me at that time. I think it got like a two page spread in Outside Magazine. And that was still kind of like the the tail end of the heyday of print. Yeah. Um, and like, Mountain biking wasn't as like kind of like mainstream in, as it is in the at least the outdoor industry um, back then. So, yeah, I think it was like I don't know the second or third spread of mountain biking in outside. Yeah, damn, that's crazy. And then to Jimmy think Chin about. put it in some like coffee book table too. It was like yeah, a, and then yeah. it got in in some other publications, a big coffee table book, and yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it was huge. I mean, it was like it was blown up Instagram at that time and yeah it was it was a cool image that's yeah. what actually changed my life because Yeti was like on the fence about sponsoring me they hit up Envy hit up Yeti and was like hey we're looking for riders you would mention my name and like yeah you know Smith as well and then that night we came back after getting that shot there's a lot to that shot but I was like Joey send that photo to Yeti send that photo <laughs> to Envy send that photo to Smith like and basically I had contracts the next day Totally. And Dylan so Stuckey, sick. like my chain, my life changed that night. Yeah. And you had barely even edited that photo. But yeah. they were like your homies and knew that you wouldn't, that they wouldn't post it. And uh, 
Yeah, yeah. three contracts that Monday morning. It was insane. <laughs> well, and we talked about it a little bit in your podcast, Sean, but like basically like, you know, you shot that photo and you were like, Joey was like, yo, the light's not good. We have to like come back and do this again tomorrow. Were you like terrified to come back the next day, like to watch him jump this canyon? Yeah, I mean, it was horrifying, but like I definitely – saw the potential in the image yeah. and, you know, it was like, if Sean will do it, I will, I will be here to take the photo. Yeah. And it, I, I knew he had it. It didn't look pleasant, but I knew he had it. Yeah. Just go fast. Just go fast. Oh so and gnarly, he did man. that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean. In the dark in the morning, but yeah, sorry. I mean, off. I wasn't like, I was like still pretty early on in my photo taking career too. So yeah. I was just like really, really thinking deeply about like, what's the best shot going to be and like, Think we we maybe did the first take a little too early when the light wasn't good. Thank you for oh, that. Oh yeah, because you did it twice, didn't you? You right did it twice day. that morning. We we left yeah. we left the hotel at like five AM. Damn. Drove up there on that bumpy road. Yep. <laughs> and it was just like Pitch cold black. February. And the sun wasn't up yet. And it was like, okay, we're getting ready. <laughs> but there's nothing to warm up on. So he had no. me at the top of the hill. He's like, just sit up there until I tell you to go. And I'm yeah. just sitting up there, like, and I, just yeah. cold. And I'm just like, oh, my we God. Just, I just got too excited, and we did the first take too early. And I love that. It immediately got so much better, and it was just, like, obvious. Yeah. yeah I love that you had Dustin looking. Zeiss, who was our digger, never held a camera really before. And you're like, all right, just stand over here. I think you had the, you know, manual focus on. You're just like, hold the trigger down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that photo turned out amazing, though, that he took. Totally. Um, But, yeah, it was funny. I hit it first. Yeah, it was too dark. I come back over. I'm just like screw this thing. I do not want to hit it again. I'm glad it's done. Joey comes over to me and he's like, I have like ethical problems asking people to do <laughs> stuff like this again. Cause I know they could get really hurt, but you have to do it again. <laughs> the light is so much better. Yeah. But was that one of the gnarlier things that you had photographed up until that point? Oh yeah, absolutely. It was definitely the gnarliest thing I'd ever shot. That's and sick. Still like, I don't know. I don't shoot a ton of big gaps or anything like that. Like I don't go to rampage and don't shoot those guys. So Never hit the Switzerland gap. Nope. That's one we've left on the table. I'll have to go back up. I don't know if I want to hit it. <laughs> <laughs> Need some work. Yeah. Um, what about hobbies and interests away from the bike and um, camera? That's something before we get too deep into the film side of things I wanted to ask. Yeah. What are you doing? I know skiing's way up there. Yeah. What I mean, else? I guess when I stepped away from racing – part of racing that I loved was the traveling and the adventure, like the, like just going to new places. And so when I picked up a camera, like a stills camera and uh, like started doing video projects, it's like, this is kind of a blank slate to go wherever I want and like actually like ride beyond the lifts yeah. where the races are at and like traverse a mountain range. So yeah, Thomas and I, uh, our first project together, we just ripped down to Peru and shot that film. And it was the first time I like was able to like go on Google Earth and like put a route together and like oh, wow. envision like riding around a mountain range in Peru. <clears throat> and at like 24, it was like the craziest, most liberating feeling to like just get on a plane and go and do this big adventure. Is this the trip your gear back got stolen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Word so, on the street is you borrowed some boxer shorts and rode, them in, rode in them for 10 days straight. It's is this true. true? It is true. Holy. <laughs> <laughs> were they stiff by the time you got done with them? Yeah. Well, we we uh, we were taking a bus from Lima to Juarez. It's yeah. like a 10-hour bus ride. And one of one of the bike bags that attached to my, like, my saddle bag, basically, that attached to the seat got stolen. And it had, like, my chamois in it and oh. all the, all the, and, like, my rain jacket and all the memory cards that we hadn't shot yet on. But like we were going to shoot the project on. So we got to Juarez with no memory cards to shoot this film on. So I got back on the bus 10 hours, back to Lima, was no in this way. market at this ATM, like getting as much money out as I can to buy these like janky cards that had probably been resold <laughs> at this market. Fake, yeah. And they worked. No way. Damn. Somehow. That's crazy, dude. And this is your Y wash trip? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Got back on the bus the next morning and we sent it for 10 days out there in the rain, getting thrashed and uh, made our first film. And that's kind of like the first film I got into a, a film festival and that kind of like 
spurred me more into as like a filmmaker, photographer in like the outdoor industry, not just the bike industry for the first time. And that was probably your first Vimeo staff pick? Yeah. 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 Um, that Y wash film for me was like the most pivotal moment for you in my eyes because like I feel like you had cornered this part of the market. Like no one was doing these bike packing trips and like you weren't swimming upstream. You didn't have all this competition. And like, yeah, you really built your own thing. And it was just like, Joey's un- in my eyes, like unstoppable because he yeah. went out and did something so different and it worked. And that, that video was captivating as much as I loved green river and elk mountains. Like I couldn't stop watching that film. So yeah, for sure. It's cool to see something when it's that original and like yeah. off the yeah. cuff and like, yeah. Where did the inspiration for something like that come from? I don't know. I, had f- can, been kind of following like the Camp Four Collective guys. Uh, and there's this guy, Renan Ozturk, who was like one of the main guys there back then. And he was a professional climber that had kind of started this hybrid career of being an adventure climber and filmmaker. And so like, I was always just like, I'm going to do that, but in biking. Yep. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for doing these bigger adventures and kind of making short films and documenting them. And immediately after releasing that film, I was like, okay, I've got all these sponsors from racing and they are way more excited about this than they ever were about any result racing. So it's like, why would I keep racing when I could put everything into this and launch a career? That is so cool. That is rad. So that, that, yeah, I think that was like probably the next most pivotal moment after the fire and kind of shifting everything then. Like making that film and seeing it stick, it was like, well, of course, like, this is what I'm going to do yeah, and invest everything in because splitting it 50, 50 just wouldn't make sense. Yep. And you get to go on an incredible trip with your best friends, right? You yeah. always had the sickest crew, you, Sam Seward. Totally. Um, yeah. And we made a bunch of those bikepacking films over the years. Yeah. So Republic cool. of Georgia. And then we got Bryce Minig, who is the editor at bike mag at the time on a bunch of them and just kind of brought in this like multi-generational like crew on a bunch. Yeah. And what, what about the crash and why wash? Didn't you, I don't know what happened, but I know you, bad concussion, you're in the middle of nowhere. How far are you from help? Like, yeah. what was that like? So we, I would say like on that trip, we were pretty inexperienced. Like it's our first big bike packing trip. We're at 17,000 feet, seven days in on a ride oh, in the, in the Peruvian Andes basically. And, uh, yeah, just shooting a clip one evening and kind of washed out and just smashed my head. And getting a concussion is not good, but getting a concussion at elevation, 17,000 17, yeah. feet where you're already like a little like warped perspective. Yeah. I was just totally out of it, like just bleeding in the tent, like Sam and Thomas are freaking out and kind of came to it enough the next morning to keep going. And then that day we got a gun pulled on us by the first people we had seen in eight days. No way. Uh, these guys were trying to like, they're just walking through the rain and for, yeah, first people we'd seen in eight days and they're like trying to get us to drink from this bottle. And we're just like, no, it's all good. And meanwhile, he's waving around this gun, waving it around. Uh, Thomas says his GoPro rolling. So it's like all on film. Oh my gosh. And he lifts it up and just shoots it right off over Sam's head. Like right no. off, like, like Boom. <laughs> that's oh my insane. gosh you yeah. know what so in the literal just, middle of nowhere and then but like you know it wasn't being like super aggressive but it was just drunk guy with a gun it's yeah. not a good scene yeah. so you're trying to play it cool so we're trying to play it cool yeah. like we're laughing and then like we're in, like all right see ya we ride off and like we're like one switch back down we just hear bam bam oh my god just like, oh. yeah you get shot up there you're I mean, uh-huh. what are you going to do? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It was but funny. No one one's going to know. I remember being on, I forgot what company you posted it with, but there was a, just kind of a recap film and there was a clip, that GoPro clip. And some guy in the comments on YouTube was like, gun safety, num- you know, number one, don't, it's like, well, or don't do that because he pointed a gun at you, but he thought like you guys are messing around. Right. If only he knew that was some random guy in Peru <laughs> that actually pulled a gun on you. Yeah. But it's just funny. Drinking yeah. some hillside booze. Like, yeah. Dude, yeah. that is so <laughs> gnarly. Yeah. That's something I've always thought about. Like when I watch those types of films is just being so far removed and off the grid and like away from medical service. Like, how have you guys like, you know, been more prepared after that? And like, are you guys doing like certification courses or bringing somebody along with you who is yeah. like a medical doctor or? Luckily, Sam, who's been on most of the big ones with me, um, he has a bunch of certs and Thomas ended up getting his woofer and 
I probably should. But yeah, you just kind of learn more after every trip and after all the mishaps, you kind of build off that and just get smarter about the routes and locations and heads up and but yeah, one off things like that you can never plan for. Yeah. But you know, generally from my experience traveling on a bike in the world, people are pretty psyched when you roll into a little village on a bike. More just like blown away that you're there doing Yeah, that. they're just like, oh, you're not like just pointing a camera out of a car. Like you're here like in the big mountains, like experiencing it. Like they'll take the time and, you you're, know, often they're like yourself. curious about your bike and want to like push on the shocks. And yeah, that's super you cool. Know, it's just refreshing to to see that. And yeah, generally anywhere in the world, people are just like to see a biker roll up through the through the mountains. That's rad. How did uh, how'd you guys pick Peru for that first project? Um. My sister had done a lot of work down in Latin America and just kind of was like, you should go to Peru. And so, yeah, at that age, it doesn't take much. You just point a direction and you're like, well, that looks cool. And, you know, Google Earth had kind of launched like, I don't know, a well, a bit before that. But just being able to like go on your computer and like fly through the mountains and like visualize it, you're just like. I can see there's single track there. Let's go. That's so cool. Was that like mostly like rudimental, just like hiking trail for people to go from like town to town? Yeah. You guys were kind of. And then we kind of figured out like all these like hiking, like trekking blogs, like German trekking blogs. Like they've trekked everywhere in the big mountains and they put nice reports together. So it's kind of like the basis of all of our trips. (laughs) Yeah. I love that dude. Just like the compiling of data to like figure out totally which direction you can go. Yeah. Like Like if someone hasn't biked it, someone's probably hiked it. Yeah. How long does planning one of these trips take? Like, Uh, I mean, I would get, I imagine why wash was a lot longer than what you do now. You kind of got your system figured out, but on average, what do you think? I mean, it's definitely a couple months of like back and forth and finding like a fixer on the ground, like drive you to the star. Yeah. And there's, there's always a lot of logistics, but it's honestly gotten easier over the years to just kind of send it and figure it out. Yep. And you guys can lean on each other, obviously. Totally. Um, obviously you've ridden in the most wild places out of anyone I know, like Mongolia, Peru, Georgia. What is the most memorable place? Like maybe desolate single track. What is that one piece of single track that comes to mind? Um, I think when we were in Mongolia, there's this mm. ribbon, a single track that we found. Um, I mean, just to put into context, getting there, it's like a two day flight to get to Ulaanbaatar. And then you get on like a regional plane across Mongolia, which is massive, like lengthwise. It's, it's really big country. So you're in the plane for hours and hours and hours, just staring out at the desert. And you're like, where are we going? <laughs> and you get to this little town, Olgi. And there's like weeds growing out of the runway. There's no security, like whatever. It's just like getting on a bus and you get there, teeny little town with like just a bunch of yurts and that's it. And you're in the most landlocked spot on earth. Like you're in the, like the center of like the largest landmass on earth. And then you take like a nine hour drive. Damn. And you're basically on the border with Russia, China and Kazakhstan in the Altai range. Um, And we actually ended up getting some of the last permits to this national park there where you don't have to have a guide with you. Hmm. So we got way out there without a guide, like probably to spots that would be like logistically really hard to get to now. Um, And we had gone up over multiple mountain passes and just dropped into this pristine valley, no roads, no people, and there's just single track down this river the whole way. That sounds insane. For, for days. Actual days. <laughs> Don't get hurt out there. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I guess you probably ride at like 60, 70% just to make sure. For sure. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you're not like completely pushing it. But yeah, in yeah. the middle of nowhere, it's like. But that's hard. I feel like sometimes when you ride 60, 70%, it's when you like wash the front too because like yeah. your timing's a little off. Like Totally. You just got to be careful, you know? Do you know what those trails were originally used for? Like that's what's always fascinating to me there's, about those things. There's some like nomadic herders there. Okay. And, and in Georgia, it's like, you know, one of the like, you know, it's a very, very old place. Like there's like abandoned towns everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So those hills have been inhabited for a long time and a long time without roads. So there's just an insane trail network yep. that sheep herders use these days and trekkers and stuff. Yep. But that place, there was amazing single track in every direction on every ridge line. Like, wow. like all like, you know, a lot of it unridden. Such a cool place. Georgia was cool. 
And that's one spot place where we did have a pretty weird mishap. Uh, there was like a lot of crazy shale there and we sliced one of our tires and like just didn't really have what we needed to fix it. Um, so we, yeah, we like didn't, we didn't have the right tube because our tubes didn't have the right depth for the MV rims at that time. So we couldn't fix it with a tube. So we had to fix it without taking the wheel of the tire off. Oh my god! So we ended up mi- mixing this scratch powder with the bit of stands that we did have and making this like super gooey gel that we like, <laughs> we aired down the tire, put this gel in it overnight and it like coagulated and no then we blew way. it up in the morning and it lasted the rest of the trip. Insanity. Yeah. So you kind of just figure it out because you have to. I can't believe that worked. I love that though. Cause that kind of like takes you back to the core of kind of like what the mountain biking, like, you know, what mountain biking is to people is just like, going out and riding bikes with your friends and solving problems on the fly. Like totally. That's kind of cool, man. That's insane though, to think about like (laughs) being that exposed and out in the middle of nowhere. And you're just like out there being like, all right, like what can we do to fix this? Totally. You're like, all right, open your bags up. What do we got? We got some stands. We got some scratch powder. I got a chocolate bar. (laughs) Give me those two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where like traveling with people that you can really trust comes into play, right? Where you can be like, all right, everybody here is can contribute value when things get really gnarly. So totally. Um, going back to Mongolia, cue the most influential Joey Schusler photo. You with the eagle, <laughs> with what you had like a explain the outfit you had going on and just the whole scenario because that's when I think of you, I think of that photo. <laughs> and is that your most famous photo? Uh, I don't know. Oh, probably our road gap. Yeah, <laughs> our canyon gap. Yeah, but uh. Yeah, we we showed up in this town Olgi and ended up staying at a like a homestay there for for like three nights with this family, um, and just kind of like getting to see their way of life. And like on the last night, the dude was like, "Come on, like put on my jacket and like take a photo with me." Um, and then he like got the, got his eagle out and started like flaring it up, and Damn, it was just that's so. I was kind of just like grinning and laughing the whole time, and yeah, just super 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 cool family. Is that like one of your favorite parts about being able to go to these like remote places is like being able to immerse yourself in these like different cultures and like how do you come across the people that are locals there? Are you looking them up on online before you kind of just stumbling across them? A little bit of both, but yeah, I did see that there was like a couple like different homestay programs available there and we kind of like met this family and they brought us in and yeah, got to eat some interesting food. Oh, that photo is so <laughs> sick. You got to send me that so I can put that in there. But I, is, I, I do have sick. a couple portraits of that family that I'd like are really cool that I Yeah, the, the still wife, enjoy she's quite sitting a bit. down, right? Yeah. That photo is amazing. The light's insane. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, it's just cool what what bikes can do. I don't know if I go to these places with, without them. It's just such a nice way to see vast landscapes, too. It's like you can cover vast swaths of land, but be like super engaged the whole time. And like, you know, lean on like the past days of racing and have a good time riding as well. But that's just, so cool. Yeah. It's it such like a puts cool it way all to see together. the world. Totally. And then, yeah, like you said, using those sponsors, you got their trust through racing and you're like, all right, I have this new idea using your communication skills that I don't have. And I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. Going. Um, yeah. What a, you have all those films up there. You got RJ, Flashes, Why Wash. Is there a favorite project to date? That's, do you think it's that Mongolia trip or? No, I I think the project with RJ is probably my favorite Mm. project ever. Um, Yeah. Little backstory on him. Like he, he kind of got hooked up through Yeti with, with uh, uh, H&R, H&M tours. um, And those guys over there, um, which all run Yetis, but him, yeah, he met Conroy when Conroy was over there on that and kind of got set up through Yeti and. Um, Conroy's like, man, you gotta, gotta make a film with this kid and kind of hopped on Skype with him, got to learn a bit about him. And then Ben Page and I went over there and, and, uh, we're with him for like a month making that film. This is Nepal, right? In Nepal. Yeah. Yeah. Where's he living? He lives in Kathmandu. Okay. Kind of on the edge and Kathmandu is surrounded pretty much 360 by mountains. 
I've um, never been there, but just seeing photos and video from yeah, there just looks it's absolutely wild. surreal, dude. For sure. Were they doing a Yeti gathering over there? Or why were they over there? Was it just a Yeah, they, they had done the first international Yeti gathering, and Chris and Hoog met, met RJ and kind of got him in the fold and sponsored him. And He's so good. And it's insane. Yeah, he's kind of like risen to be the the top rider in like kind of that, you know, Asian area. Um, he races in China and India, and he's raced all over the region and kind of wins everything these days. Need to get him to an EWS. I, I know, know he's been wanting to. Yeah. So. That's so rad. Um, but yeah, I mean, he just grew up in Kathmandu, welded his first bike together with like some like random like pipe and scraps he found and eventually became a guide and now he's riding beautiful beautiful bikes beautiful yeah very very high level it's always cool to see like those types or those areas in the world that are so remote and like somebody like that pops up and like then industry pop like the bike industry like starts gravitating towards those places like that's a really cool thing to see yeah. Yeah. start to happen totally and it makes sense i mean they have like some of the biggest most beautiful mountains in the world and yeah, RJ gets to ride him all the time. I'm That's super jealous. To, yeah, guide yeah, people, right? He's got a good scene. How long did um, that RJ Ripper um, film take? So we were we were in Kathmandu and the surrounding areas for like a month. So That's a big one. Yeah, got to spend some good time with RJ. Went riding with him for a couple of days, like really eased into the project. And then, yeah, kind of just shot more of like a documentary style piece on his story of how he came up and got his start in Kathmandu and how he has gotten to where he is today. Um, and like, yeah, through the film, we actually got him out to the States for his first time ever. Um, like from his, from his like F economic status in Kathmandu, it's actually almost impossible to get a visa to, to come to the U S um, like, unless you're like in the top, like, you know, 5%, it's like really hard to get visas. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, actually ended up like, getting a ton of different letters written and finally got him over here for, for one of the premieres at one of the film festivals. No way. That's badass. Yeah. I and bet he, he ended up so being pumped. like the, the national geographic adventure of the year that year. Wow. Um, what an accolade. A lot of cool stuff came from that project. RJ. That's would you incredible. say if you had to guess Chris Conroy's favorite film you did for Yeti, you think it would be RJ? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, so it's just, you know, the most like real story we've ever done for yeah. Yeti project. A lot of them are beautiful. A lot of them are really fun, but that one was like more heart heartwarming, I guess. Yeah, that's badass. Talking about like all these really cool places that you've been and traveled to, I'm very interested. What was your favorite meal and where was it? Ooh. <laughs> well, because I'm sure you've encountered some wild I, food. I don't, I don't know if the favorite meal sticks with me as yeah. much as <laughs> some of the weirder ones. Yeah, let's hear some of the weirder <laughs> ones then. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we ended up. In, in Mongolia, some of the food was pretty interesting. They have a lot of like, uh, they'd have these like fur bags on the wall with fermented, just different fermented things because they don't have refrigeration. So, you know, that's kind of where like a lot of fermented arts kind of came from. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they had like this fermented horse milk in this bag on the wall and it's like so rude to not drink it. Yeah. And so once you get over the mental barrier of what it is, it's like, really not that bad it's just kind of like a sour kombucha interesting <laughs> that's not too bad <laughs> yeah i feel like that's the hardest part about like some of the stuff that you're doing while you're like way out in the middle of nowhere is like you have to like you know be a part of that culture because it is yeah. so rude like even like the guy swinging the gun around where you're not drinking his booze like yeah that is such like a like it is a <laughs> fuck you to somebody if you're not like indulging in what they're offering yeah totally that's gnarly. Do you think if you picked that up from Whole Foods, I'm talking about the horse milk, <laughs> and it said, you know, sour kombucha and tried it, would you be like, ah? Uh, well, I wouldn't trust whoever's doing it for Whole Foods. I want the real thing. <laughs> no, the if bag. you didn't know it was horse milk, that's what I'm saying. Would you be like, this is just weird? Like, yeah. It wouldn't be like that yeah, you'd off the wall. Leave, you'd only be a little bummed out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joey's funny. Like, we'll go on film trips. He's like, yeah, we're going to be at this remote cabin. You know, I'll have a water filter. We'll do this for food. And we get up there, and he's like, yeah, I didn't bring a water filter. Just drink out of the creek. So for like 10 <laughs> days, he just made us drink out of the creek with no filter. He's like, we're so high up, you're not getting Giardia. Yeah, <laughs> you're stronger for it. I mean, I didn't get sick, but I was kind of mad at you in, in the beginning. <laughs> I was like, no way. There has to be animals above this. Something's just dead up in the creek above me. Yeah, and that was pretty lucky in retrospect. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Do you know where that was? 
was that up in BC? Yeah, Valmont. Yeah, yeah Valmont. I always think of Valmont. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, what about the biggest mistake you've had happen on a shoot? Um, Besides smashing your face up in Peru. Biggest mistake. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. <laughs> Can I answer? Can I interject one? <laughs> <laughs> you had, we were up in, talking about Valmont. We yeah. were in Golden, BC. You had oh, just I think bought I know this story. Oh, this, this has happened a number of times. I know, but <laughs> it was this a, happened a number of but times. But it was the first time it had happened, I think. You had bought this brand new 8K helium red camera. You're all jazzed on it. Our first day shooting, we set up eight hours, this cable cam that went, you know, 500 feet, and you're at the bottom and cut through the line and dropped the red. And you came down so nonchalant. I was freaking out because I just see this camera there. We had just started shooting. I'm like, oh, my God, the camera's dead. You know, because that rig's probably 50, 100. I have no idea. It's a I lot mean, of money. For anybody listening, like, we're talking about a camera that costs more than a car. Yeah. Most, the average car. So, falling yeah. off of, you know, falling what, 40, and 50 I had feet? I just gotten it. Yeah. This was literally the first day of shooting. With so, no way. I'm yeah. the only one at the bottom. <laughs> and I see this red just tumbling. And I'm just like, yeah. oh, my God. And it God. was the early days of the cable cam where we didn't really have it all figured out and this wasn't like a consumer item where there's like youtube videos where you like learn how to use it it was like yeah i some bought dude this thing like, yeah, making like it. some dude made it and there's no instructions and it was like figure out the rigging yourself figure out how it works like there was nothing telling you how to do it so i'm at the bottom waiting for chaos I'm chaos. And Joey walks down like a Sunday afternoon, like he's walking to the general store. And I'm just like, how in the hell is he so calm? And you just like picked it up and it was fine. The Ronin was messed up, but like the camera was fine. Yeah. But I just couldn't, I will never forget how calm he was. And I was just like, I would have not been him. I would have been cursing. I would have been throwing so many F-bombs. I mean, it fell like 40 feet out of a tree. And somehow and it's survived. Like, it's like a, with the gimbal, like a 20 plus pound camera setup, dude. Landed on a really steep hill of moss and like that's totally rolled out of it. Yeah. Were you expecting it just to be done? I, I don't even know. I was just like, oh, well. You're like, so this is why we have insurance. Let's go take a look. <laughs> All right. So that's my guess at the biggest yeah. mistake, but it sounds like not. Nah. Like what's your, well, uh, it kept working. And then we actually ended up getting some of my favorite cable cam shots of all time. What, ever after what that. failed on the thing was, did it uh, just burn through the so line? It was, we were pushing, we thought we were returning it back up the hill and you couldn't see, we couldn't see it cause the line was so long, but we we're actually pushing it down the line uh, and it was just burning out on itself and it just cut through the line. Wow. Yeah. That's and And moment. now they're so nice. There's like, you just tutorials push button and, it does and it's it. got endpoints that it can't pass. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I would assume then it's it, there got wasn't traction like traction control so it won't burn out or it knows <laughs> if it is. It's like, was that your cable cam? Did you rent it? No, it was mine. I bought it off eBay used for like four grand. And oh, I was wow. like, so psyched. That's crazy. Yeah, I'm sure with it not having like those endpoints where you can set A and B or wherever, oh, like yeah. you're just standing there manually doing it. Like you yeah. don't know what's going to happen. I loved setting that uh, cable cam up again. <laughs> I didn't, didn't realize how big of a deal that is. That one was bad, but the other one we did, which I think that was my favorite, where yeah. you were like perpendicular. And yeah. Just that manual shot. So cool. But um, yeah, what would you say? Biggest mistake on a shoot? Um, I mean, those, like when you break gear and it's insured, it's just like, damn. Yep. Um. And that's happened a number of times. A couple big cable cram crashes, actually. Yeah. A <laughs> couple, couple big insurance claims. Yeah. Um, I feel like you could have made me look skinnier. There's on only film. one thing that, like, still eats away at me at night. Yeah. And it was this China trip that I did with Sam Seward and Bryce Minig. We were 10 days, 10 days up above 16,000 feet in uh, this, like, Tibetan little, like, enclave province in, in China. Kind of, like, on the eastern edge of the Himalaya. And it just took so much to get there. It was just like days of driving and just absolute misery to like break up this canyon valley to get into the Alpine. And we did this loop and it was raining the whole time, but there was just these epic scenes of like mist and like the mountains unveiling themselves and just big, big, big landscapes. And like it was so much work to get there that it very much felt like this is like a one in a lifetime, once in a lifetime kind of thing. Like it's physically everything I got, it's mentally everything I can got. It's logistically a nightmare. 
and we got there and like one of the cameras got pretty soaked and I was just so psyched like on more frames. So I just kept using it and kept shooting and kept shooting and like this card got corrupted oh. uh, and it had some bangers on it. Bangers. Like amazing photos that I can still just like think about. Yeah. And you know, there was like more days in the trip and we kind of picked it up and restarted and just kept going. And we're like, well, we'll make the film from here and Fuck. we'll start the photos from here. And it was just a slog, honestly. Dang. And, then, and then I remember just getting back to the hotel and I like couldn't get it to work and I had all the software running it, couldn't get it to work. Just remember like bashing my head on like the bed board in this like Chinese hotel room. Just oh like so pissed. Ready to start crying. So I'm pissed. Sure. Oh my god. And then I like gosh. sent it across the US on this like whirlwind tour of like media card experts and no one could get it. Like no one could get the data off of it. <sighs> Fuck. And it was just gone. And it was like eight months of just this pit feeling in my I have stomach. Such sweaty palms right now. <laughs> yeah. That gives me I the heebie jeebies. Suck, especially like when you you were there and you saw it and you have those images burned into your totally. brain and you and can it was still just like I was them. like on like the edge of like my limit of like what I can do to get those and then they're just gone. Uh -huh. Do you do anything different now? Do you shoot on multiple cards or is it just I mean, that, that one when weird it's like time? expedition stuff like that? It's just you're not bringing a laptop. Know, you can't yeah. back it up. Like yeah. Do you know why it corrupted? Do you have any idea or was okay. it just a freak accident? It's just like a freak I think the camera just got wet and then like since I kept shooting and turning it on and like kind of short. Yeah. Damn. They just couldn't get it. Dang. Well, uh, talking about, I mean, that's an interesting aspect to these journeys is like when you're mentally exerting yourself and physically, because like if you're filming athletes, they're not necessarily mentally exerting themselves in the way that you are. Like, how do you prepare yourselves for that or yourself? Because I mean, like, that's pretty gnarly. <laughs> like you don't really you yeah. just kind of go into it with like a gung ho attitude and just, absolutely go for it yeah like there's like a company is giving you money to make this project and there is way too many unknowns and like risks involved for it to make any sense like from like a reasonable standpoint um but you just kind of like keep pushing on and and hope for the best and that's like at least for the adventure content usually when the best stuff comes do you think the trips have gotten harder i feel like in the beginning of stuff you have that gung-ho attitude do you think you've gotten more mature like taken i think we've been able to for granted <laughs> almost now a little bit i think like, we can calculate it out a bit better now and yeah not have to take as many risks i just feel like why wash is probably like the craziest thing ever yeah. and like no matter what went wrong you were in peru on your bikes yeah. and like i don't know now that you've traveled the world like totally but you, i mean there's there's risks in every project like yeah, for sure sean and i are going to italy in two weeks and we're renting a 1980s convertible to drive across the country in so. why are you spilling the beans dude? <laughs> I'm just kidding. we'll see how that goes yeah yeah good luck with that is it an italian convertible because if so you guys are fucked <laughs> uh yeah i don't know really yeah. yeah if it's an italian vehicle good luck well it's better she the lady we're renting it from says it's better than the one that we wanted <laughs> oh no uh, i can bring already uh, picture extra it. tools and lots of oil yeah I can already picture when it breaks down, we're going to take it to a mechanic. We're going to be behind on the shoot. We're going to be like, hey, we really need this fixed. We'll pay you extra. And they'll be like, it's okay. It's okay. You come back next week. And you're like, no, no, no. I like, need it tomorrow. It's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> That's like my life in Italy. Too. Yeah. They're like, I love how chill yeah. they are. Just and on their own timeline. Dude. They are. But yeah. like, I appreciate it. It's like, you know, my emergency doesn't need to be their problem. Totally. Yeah. Time, you yeah. Know? And we also have a 22-pound a lens that we're shooting the project on. You need to tell them about the anamorphic <laughs> lens. That's from the uh, 1970s St. Petersburg, oh, Soviet era. That's uh, badass. Yeah, so. One of one? Been, been doing one of one. <laughs> Just getting insurance for this trip on that thing was insane. Oh, I can't yeah. imagine. It's one of one. I think they valued it at like ninety five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive for some glass. So we'll be we'll be strapping it to our bodies. Can't wait Keeping to drop that off at all of times. cable cam. <laughs> oh my gosh. Imagine, no, dude. No, no. <sighs> yeah, I can't imagine like just just the mental preparation that you're having to go through. Like when you are planning all these things out, even just talking about this Italy trip, just like being being somebody that has to ride your bike and keep up with everybody, but also toting gear and making sure that your gear is clean and that you have the memory cards that they're not getting stolen off your bike. Like that's gotta be a lot, man. Yeah. But it kind of comes with the territory of the job. Like you're on 
when you're on, you're on. And it's going to be like three weeks in Italy where we're just like constantly mentally engaged, just like going for it, pushing it a bit. And then the benefit of the job is you get a couple of weeks at home and you can kind of like decompress a bit. So I kind of like it that way. It's like just all intensity or not, like just struggle with the jobs that are a little more. A little more rigid a daily, in the way. A daily, like a daily duty kind of thing. Yeah. Um, a when you're talking about Renan and, you know, you got Woodson, Ben Page, you're surrounded by such incredible artists. Is there some um, people out there that could be photographers or filmmakers that just like consistently inspire you? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's, it's such a cool job because anyone that gets into it is going to pour their heart into it. And uh, there's so many people from different backgrounds coming into it that everyone has a bit of a different take on it. Um, and honestly, that's the best part of the job for me is just the people you get to work with. Like yeah. everyone's so interesting and so fun to be around. And just the nature of the job, you're working with different people all the time. And I definitely find that to be the most interesting and exciting part about it. Um, but yeah, there's an insane amount of talent in, in the outdoor freelance film photo space. It's it's insane. And somehow we're all staying busy, which is rad. That's yeah, good. that's super cool. Do you feel like it's getting more concentrated with the amount of talent that's starting to flow into there just because it is becoming more of a popular thing to be a part of or I think it would be really hard to get into it now yeah I think in 2014 when I committed to it it was a really great time a lot of things were kind of just kicking off then a lot of niches were not filled Nope. and now people kind of call you because they know what you're good at and what yeah. you can do and you have the 10 years of experience to be that much more valuable at it um but yeah, I think it's always going to be competitive, but I mean, it's like kind of the way that people and brands and organizations can communicate in this, this world, this internet world we yeah. live in these days. So there's, there's no shortage of it, of work and, and opportunity. What do you think are some of the biggest hurdles that creatives, freelance people have to, you know, get over right now or, you know, create skill sets to thrive is that that communication piece? Because I feel like there's incredible yeah. artists out there, but they don't know how to totally, you know, get those clients. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to balance being an artist, which is like a very like emotional, like just kind of like follow your guts, kind of follow your brain, kind of thing. And then the business side of it's very like analytical and calculated and communication based. And balancing those two is obviously pretty challenging yeah. for for anyone, and really challenging for some people. But totally. Um, yeah, I don't know. If you were, uh, if you were facing the problem that we're talking about right now, just like how many people and how much talent's involved now, if you were getting into it now yourself, how do you think you would like, uh, navigate that path? Or do you have like, are you just like, I don't know. I don't know. know. Yeah. I, I don't want to think about it. I'm glad I don't. Yeah. That's a, that's um, a lot to swallow. Just kind of sitting yeah. here thinking about it. But, but I think once you are established, there's this constant pressure on yourself of like, you could always be doing more. You could always be getting more jobs. You could always be pushing harder to the next big thing. And I think, you know, like Thomas and I talk about it a lot. I think it's like really important to like find a balance in life too. Um, and I think, you know, the last couple of years I've tried to find that a bit more. There was definitely years where I was gone eight months out of the year, still trying to have a girlfriend and yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's hard to hammer keep up that. relationships and yeah. you lose friendships and you fall out of touch with people. And so now just trying to be able to a point where you can like pinpoint the projects that you really want to put everything into, say no to the faff that you don't want to do and find a balance in life and, you know, work on your relationship with your partner and your friends and that kind of stuff. It's really hard when you're freelance because no one's telling you, you have to be here from here to here and get this done. It's like, you could always be doing more always. Yeah. Yep. So it's like up to you to have this internal clock of like, no, shutting it off. Yep. And I think you have found that balance. You move back up to the mountains, you know, that has to like feel pretty grounding. And, uh, yeah, I, I would say you're a lot happier than you were when you, not that Longmont's a bad place, but it seems like you're just, you found your your spot up there. So 
Hopefully I can get up there soon. <laughs> do, do, you, uh, do you find yourself being more creative when you are able to refill your cup that way, like spending time with your partner and just, you know, spending time with your friends and things like that, as opposed to, you know, being out there on the road for eight to yeah. 10 months a I year? I mean, I think the less work I do, the more creative I can make the work that I do do. Yeah. Like you just be that yeah. much better. It's you far know? more impactful when you can yeah. actually like pour your being totally. into it. Totally. When you're just trying to like crank out jobs, it's like, it's not going to be that creative, but like when you can just fully invest and, but yeah, you kind of got to get to a point where you can afford that, you know, yeah. and you have you to can, do the eight to 10 yeah, months out there. You're not to worried be able about get... how much you're making in a day. You're worried about like this project has to be perfect. Yeah. But do you have those jobs that you might not love, but you take because of the money so you can, you know, maybe not take as much on a, something that your heart's really in and for sure. Your heart and, soul. and that's a hard balance to find too. Yeah. And you don't always get to dictate who's going to hit you up for what jobs. So yep. you're kind of on a roller coaster ride sometimes. Totally. Sometimes you want to be on a really like drawn out creative job. And you just get a commercial job yeah. and you're just like, well, I guess we're doing this. Yeah. I feel like that's the hard part about that type of work, right? Is you kind of have to take it as it comes. Yeah. And like, so, you know, sometimes you, uh, you have a, a ton of people that are wanting work and other times you're yeah. just like, well, uh, where are the people? Yeah. What's, uh, you know, we talked about one of the biggest mistakes you feel like you've made out on a shoe or, you know, something that's gone wrong. What's a what's a gnarly gamble you've taken while you were out there that actually paid off in a big way? I mean, I think it's got to be that first film project that we committed to making the bikepacking film in Peru. Yep. We had no financial sponsorship whatsoever. I had like five thousand dollars in my bank account to my name and just like bought Thomas and I take Tom Samus Thomas Sam and I tickets to Peru. Yeti sponsored us by giving us a couple old five seven five demo bikes that we could then sell at the end of the trip. And that was like the first time I'd ever gotten like money as like, you know, outside of being at a company to make a film. That's so sick. And then like once the film was done, we were able to get more sponsors on board because they were like, this is cool. Um, Who'd you get on board? Camelback and Smith maybe? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, a couple other small things. But but I think that's like one thing, like going back to the question of like, what would you say to young people getting, you know, newer people getting into yeah. to film stuff? Like I, every budget that I got for every project for the first like four or five years, I spent every dime putting it back into the project. Didn't make it any money, any money at all. And then, you know, especially on like those film festival projects, like I would invest everything back into it. And then like all of a sudden I had a career and I could make some money, but yeah. What would you it say? Was, it, it was just like blind faith, like just like, well, it's going to be that much better if we invest this in. It so has to be this way. It has to be this way. What would you say your biggest sacrifice, you know, over how long you've been doing the film thing, 10 years now? What do you think it was those early days? Um, yeah, it was It was definitely those early days. It was like that project. And then like, like I honestly wanted to like live with some buddies like in college, right after college and chose to live with my parents for a couple of years. And, you know, I was saving like ten, twelve thousand dollars a year, invested that all in camera gear and got a red by the time I was like 25, 24. And that's kind of when I started like leveling up. I, I just kind of invested a lot on the front end there. And it just took, yeah, a bit of a sacrifice socially and like some things that I wanted to do in life. Yeah. Had to kind of sit on the side for a minute, but. I mean, going back to Garrett's um, podcast from Pine, he said the same thing. He started a print shop that did these teas at 22, and he's like, biggest sacrifice. Yeah, it was socially, you know, everything I could have done in my 20s, I invested into my business. Yeah. I, I couldn't yeah. hang out with the friends. I couldn't I mean, do this. There's so I much going on socially then. Well, yeah. it comes back to like, you know, your partner or starting a family or all those things. Like you kind of have to put all that stuff to the side, like riding bikes or like going out and drinking beers with your friends. Like that all, that all uh, comes second to – making the dream come true so yeah that's that's super cool to like hear that and vocalize that and like kind of a reoccurring thing too yeah. with people that have you know became great at something is you know giving up those social you know events and just really investing back into yourself or what you're doing right mm -hmm. um well just even you know reinvesting the money that's been earned back into projects like there's a there's a youtuber that just crossed the hundred hundred million subscriber mark his name is mr beast and i've listened to a lot of his like podcasts recently and he talks about that he's like dude for the first eight years of me doing youtube i reinvested every single dollar 
except for, you know, what I needed to eat. And that's like pretty bizarre to think about, but it's like, like you said, it's, that's what makes something great is when you're pouring not only just like every being of your part of your soul into something, but also like every dollar to your name, like yeah you you can't fail when you're doing something like that totally that's and, not and an there's, option there's still projects where that happens like i'll dedicate like try to dedicate like one project a year where you're just like not going to make a dime on this going to invest everything back in let's it, make it sweet don't give me that i know that's your sales pitch <laughs> on everything like hey we're super tight on this i'm like hooking you up <laughs> like we're gonna make it happen no matter what i'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no i love that though that, but, I mean, it stay, keeps you true to your roots too, though. That's why you keep well, coming th- back yeah, to I doing just think the work. It, I think it's important because you get to a certain level and then if you can put that much more resource into it, you can like, yep. you can always take it to another level. But your heart's got to be there, yeah, obviously. But it's got to be yeah. the right project. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's the thing on. that re-inspires you and keeps you coming back at day over day, right? So yeah. like, if you're not doing those things, then there's a certain point where you're just like, well, why the fuck am I doing this? Because I'm not leveling up. I'm not growing. Like, you got to pour yourself into those projects in that way. Even if you are, you know, negative on the income side of it, like you're like, holy shit, like I feel good about this. Like, you know, because at the end of the day, like I think we can all agree, like the money aspect of everything that we do doesn't really matter. It's how you feel like and how much soul you've put into what people are seeing, you know? And I think the biggest thing that I found is like to reinvest all that time reinvest all that money you have to have these little wins i think that's getting that clip you know that you wanted because of that lens or you know me investing in my racing getting that better result or whatever it is you know like you have to have those little wins to keep wanting more and to keep dedicating yourself so totally i think that's like for me even with traction like those little wins yeah like you have to have them like there's a reason you know we're four that's what makes it fun yeah Yeah. exactly so when it's also hard to be like aware of those wins too right like because when you're in the thick of it and you're like just trying to see what comes next you're not really being super aware of like oh somebody was somebody sent me a message on instagram they're really stoked about this project that's a win you know and that should fill that cup to continue to show up and like yeah being aware of like when you do have those wins and like you know, losses are going to come regardless, but like you, you have to earn those wins and yeah, just be aware of when those are coming along. Like, totally. Um, I think we'll start wrapping this up and can't thank you enough to come all the way down here. I know it's not the shortest drive for you, but um, one thing I want to ask is if you could go back to 18 year old Joey and tell him something, what piece of advice would you tell him? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> it's a loaded question. 18 year old Joey. Just, I don't know, calm down a bit. I was <laughs> I was riled up. Just getting on the race team, of course you were riled up. Yeah. It was, a, it was an exciting time for sure. Yeah. But just maybe too excited. Go ride in mud before you go to Europe? Yeah. Definitely should have gone somewhere muddy for a couple months before that season. Yeah. But no, I mean, it's just, it feels good to be 32 and look back on the last 10 years and just be like, I'm happy with how I did that. That's a really good feeling to have for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a very, without putting in all the sacrifice and the gambles and all those things, like I don't think a lot of people look back on, you know, their 20s and kind of feel that same way. So that's a really cool thing to hear. Yeah. Wrapping it back up, like it's, it's, it kind of comes down to who you surround yourself with too, you know? Yeah. Um, And just having parents that worked for themselves growing up, I was like, well, that's that's what you can do and you can do it that way and totally. now i like can't imagine it any other way yeah i'm sure you guys as business owners can associate with that as well yeah certainly i mean i grew up kind of in the same way where like my grandparents and parents both owned businesses and like for me there was no other you know way to go about life that would i would feel fu- feel fulfilled you know just seeing my parents doing that and like when i worked for other people i'm like this is not it <laughs> Yeah. You know, and seeing them come home at the end of the day. So that's like a cool, cool point to hear. Um, do you have any parting motivating words for people listening that are maybe looking into getting into doing the type of work you're doing or, you know, something along the same lines? I think just like follow the follow the feelings and follow the passion. Like that that's all I've done and anyone else that I've seen be successful has done really. Um, you just gotta gotta go off like instinct really. And just follow the passion. And go all in. Go all in. All in or nothing. Yep. I love it, man. Anyone uh, you'd like to give a shout out to? 
Damian oh, Smith, Craig Grant. <laughs> um, <There's> definitely, <laughs> I don't know. That's the thing about the the world Sean and I were able to grow up in through bikes is like just chocked full of incredible people. Yep. It really is. And like you can just trace it back like, I don't know, 20 plus years at this point. Well, this person led to me meeting that this first person catalyst. To, this, to this, to this, to this. And it's like insane. Yeah. There's dozens and it's dozens hard to of track people that down. have done so much. Yeah. All right, just say your wife's name, just so we can wrap this up. <laughs> Sweet Jenna. Sweet Jenna. Thank you for keeping this boy sane. Heck yeah. And last but not least, do you have any new projects on, on the horizon that you'd like to allude to or anything like that? Well. Anything you're excited about? We, we did a bit, but I think the big project for this year is uh, this one with Sean here in Italy coming up. Keep heck, an eye out for it next year. Heck yeah. Yeah. Do you have any sort of idea when that one should be starting to hit festivals or whatever it's going to next debut sp- Next on? spring. Next spring. Yeah. Heck yeah, man. Well, yeah, I'm excited to see and hear more about it as you guys yeah, get we'll, out there. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I think it should be super fun, but yeah, man, this yeah. was a, this was a treat. I really appreciate you coming down. Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank you guys. Yeah, Maybe. man. We'll, blast. Uh, blast. Make sure you hey, get man. get some beans out there. We've got a killer new Columbia that you're going to really enjoy sipping on. And oh, yeah. What's your favorite coffee we have made? Before we wrap up. I don't know. I'm on that subscription. I get it all. Yeah. I know. That's why I asked. You've had like all of them. Je- Jenna's got a more refined palate than I Ooh. do. So you should really what, what phone a friend What does she enjoy? Here. Do you know? <laughs> I think it's the Columbia. Okay. Okay, good. That's Sweet. good to hear. Have you tried any of the snap chill cans yet? The cold coffees? No, no. Oh, we'll, we'll make sure that you go home with a couple of each of those. But yeah. Uh, yeah, with that being said, thank you guys all so much for listening. If you're enjoying these episodes on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you're listening to them on Spotify, Apple, or Amazon, please leave us a review. It endlessly helps with this project. We seriously appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, with that being said, thanks for being a part of the Traction family. We'll catch you on the next one. Keep being scared of normal. You're the man. Cheers. <laughs>